heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Caroline Hyde's out today. This is Bloomberg Technology. China's semiconductor and electronics output drops in the first quarter as a bullish rebound in the economy is at odds with a smartphone slowdown. And Apple pushes higher as Tim Cook opens the iPhone maker's first store in India. We bring you the details from Mumbai and California. And in Europe, venture capitalists are on pace for their worst funding year since 2015. Race Capital's Alfred Trung joins us to talk private markets. Does less capital mean fewer checks being cut? Well, first, let's get a check on those markets. Move us Katie Greifoud out in New York. Hi, Katie. Hi, Ed. Well, the bid has disappeared from the equity market. You're looking at the S&P 500 off by about two-tenths of a percent. The same thing sort of goes for the NASDAQ 100, those big tech names. It's the financials that are interesting today. We're actually off the session lows, uh, that sector down about three-tenths of a percent. We know that Goldman, Bank of America, big weights today after reporting earnings earlier today. And the two-year Treasury yield up slightly, about two basis points or so. You can see we are above 420 on the two-year Treasury yield. Let's get to the fun stuff, though. Let's talk about Bitcoin. Bitcoin has been really interesting. It used to trade hand in hand with those tech stocks. You can see that that relationship is really broken apart. And today's action drives that point home. You can see Bitcoin up by two and a half percent. It is above 30,000 once again. It's going to be interesting to continue to watch this one and keep an eye on that correlation. But let's go from the big picture to some of those micro names. And we should start with NVIDIA, higher by almost 3% today. It had one sell rating left. That was HSBC, that analyst changing its tune today. A rare double upgrade. He went from a, buy, a sell to a buy. You can see that is filtering through to NVIDIA shares. We're also looking at AMD. Not too much action there. No real news. The stock is higher by about half a percent or so on some heavy volume, too. So keep an eye on that. And Southwest West Airlines briefly halted all of its flights due to a technology issue. Right. As we understand, those flights have resumed. Stock still off by about 1.6%. Yeah, we're going to get a deeper report on Southwest later on in the show, but it is interesting to note a little outperformance in the chip space. Thank you, Katie Greifert out in New York. So despite a bullish rebound in the economy, China's production of chips and other electronics are declining from slower sales as well as competitive pressures from factories that are in other locations. Joining me here in San Francisco, Bloomberg's Ian King. There is a short-term story here and there is a longer-term story. Let's start with the short-term. What's happening? Yeah, I mean, think about what the companies have told us. They've said, look, there's just too much inventory out there. There isn't enough phone demand. There isn't enough PC demand. We need to dig our way out of that mound of inventory, and then we can go back to shipping towards what end demand is. The question is, well, where is end demand? Are we pre-pandemic levels, or are we at some level in between the peaks that we saw during the pandemic? We'll see in the second half. The, the broader debate is about supply chain, de-risking or diversifying, moving out of China. What does this data signal about that? I think the, the big underlying concern, and we won't really see that manifest itself until sort of next year, the year after, when a lot of these factories get built, is governments everywhere around the world are saying, hey, we want a chip industry, we want a chip industry, throwing money at it. The economics that once drove where these chip plants were made arguably being upturned, so yes. are we going to see excess supply? Over the Taiwan Strait, there's a bit more feel-good about the state of chips and manufacturing. TSMC, it's interesting, you look at the data on the Bloomberg, the subject of our tech watch column, a lot of bullishness around that name. Yeah, I mean, TSMC is a conduit for everyone, so if you believe in NVIDIA's AI story, where does NVIDIA get its chip made? In Taiwan, at TSMC. Um, so, you know, TSMC is kind of the way to play every angle here, even though smartphones and PCs are kind of down. Maybe AI is the play, as NVIDIA yes. would suggest. Well, I, I probably should have started with NVIDIA. Yeah. Katie mentioned it. It's final sell rating gone yep. this morning. Yep. Uh, we'll bring up the, where, where analysts see the stock, but lots of bullishness, and it's all, well, it's partly about artificial intelligence. Yeah, I mean, the HSBC report, which was the, the final one to flip, said, look, even though there aren't that many AI chips in the world, these things cost 10, 20 grand each, right? That's 10 times what a, a PC GPU costs. So even if PCs are bad, 
AI is good in terms of the, the ASP, the margins and everything else. That's the argument. All right. Thanks to Bloomberg's Ian King on everything semiconductor. Now, we talked about China. China's economy actually growing at the fastest pace in a year in the first quarter, giving the market some optimism, which I have to say was pretty short-lived because we're now getting some jitters over a report that St. Louis Fed President James Bullard is in favor at this time of more policy tightening. Joining us to talk these markets, Emily Hill, CEO and founding pa partner of Bowersock Capital. L let's go to China first, Emily. In very basic terms, there was optimism about, around the, the reopening of the economy, strong GDP print. How in the markets do you interpret that? Well, we got pretty good GDP numbers out of China, 4 to 5 percent. The government's target for the year is about 5. So I think it shows that reopening is having exactly the effect that people anticipated. Consumers are getting out and spending. And that will be inflationary for the rest of the global economy. More demand for, com for commodities, including oil. And so while it will help economic growth, from an inflation perspective, it's probably not a positive. Let's bring it back here to the United States and the Fed. And I promise you we will talk about the technology sector. But Fed's Bullard saying that basically these ideas of recession are a little bit overdone and that he wants to see the, the, the discussion around more hikes. What's your interpretation of Fed speak right now? I think the, the market is continuing to not get the Fed's message. And I've been saying that consistently. And I think part of the issue is that all of the hikes in recent memory, if you look back at the last 30 years, took place in an environment that was essentially disinflationary. We had low inflation. It was a very different environment than one we have now. And so last 30 years, the pauses by the Fed have extended from about six months to about 14 months. And you're still seeing large parts of the market expecting a rate cut by the end of this year. And so I, I think there are going to be some disappointed investors. Uh, and so I think, you know, while you do have some dovish members of the Fed, None of them are really talking about a rate cut in 2023. If we were to have a rate cut, it would mean that we had a hard landing, and that's not good for stocks. Emily, this is Bloomberg Technology. Let's talk a little bit about the technology sector. You know, if, if you expect this, this rate and inflation regime to persist, where do you want to position yourself within the technology landscape? Well, you know, there's defensive tech, which I, and I would put Apple into that category. And I think it is sort of Apple is the, you know, Johnson and Johnson of the 21st century, right? It's, it's, it's looked at as a safe bet. You know, it now comprises seven to eight percent of the S&P, which I think is something that, you know, should raise a few eyebrows. But if the parts of, you know, but I would say that Apple and these, this, you know, safe defensive tech is now, a little bit richly priced. So if I want to look in the tech sector for good values, I'm going to look at, or I would really actually even look at tech adjacent sectors. So the parts of the, of the tech sector that have not gone through the roof this year, you know, the NASDAQ 100 is up almost 20%. And I think that's overdone. If you're going to be a little bit more dynamic and look for opportunity in this market away from well, you call them defensive, right? I think you're, you're, you're suggesting look at the balance sheet, look at this company's staying power through a recession. But technologically speaking, what are the corners of the market that excite you? Okay, well, I would say companies like Corning that are manufacturing products used by Apple. So they make differentiated glass products. They make the Gorilla Glass for iPhone, Ceramic Shield. They make ceramic substrates that are used in cutting carbon emissions. And so they're, you know, a less exciting, you know, tech, software, innovative company. But this company has been innovating for, you know, 170 years. Shares of Capcom surged to a record on Tuesday after the Japanese company unveiled Monster Hunter Now!, a new mobile game developed with Pokemon Go creator Niantic. The company's stock rose 9% in Tokyo, adding to a winning streak that's seen the company quadruple its value over the past four years. The Osaka-based creator of Resident Evil and Street Fighter 
is Japan's top maker of big budget titles for both consoles and PCs. Now, we were just talking about Apple. So coming up, Apple opens in India. Why Tim Cook thinks the new expansion will help accelerate sales growth. I actually want to take a look at the shares as well. Some momentum earlier in the session when it came to Apple was still up by four tenths, half a percentage point while the rest of the market is giving away. A big part of this as well is news in the last 24 hours of that 4.15% yield on a savings account with Goldman Sachs, which we'll also discuss out of California. This is Bloomberg. Customers are lining up as Apple opens its first two stores in India. They may not be as unique as the Cube in New York, but they have all the features that Apple stores do worldwide today in Apple, Apple store trade-ins, and the customary site of CEO Tim Cook at the front door on the first day, welcoming the first few customers. Now, between meeting Prime Minister Modi, hobnobbing with business leaders here in Mumbai and then in Delhi, and eating Mumbai vada pav with film stars, Tim Cook's visit to India and these store openings mark a significant next step in the India-Apple relationship. India presents a critical supply chain diversification opportunity for Apple. China manufactures more than 90% of iPhones to AirPods. Tim Cook says Apple is taking all that it learned in China, how to scale China, and bringing that to bear here in India. Compared to its neighbor, India is a tiny market for Apple, with just about $6 billion in annual sales last year. But that's about 50% more than the year before. Local manufacture will allow Apple to reduce some of the import taxes that it pays and make its products less expensive for Indian consumers. Two of Apple's three contract manufacturers here in the country are major beneficiaries of a flagship production incentive scheme launched by Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government. India, too, is hoping that Apple can pull a China here, help build a manufacturing ecosystem that boosts jobs and exports. Menika Doshi, Bloomberg News. That was Bloomberg's India senior editor, Manaka Doshi. Let's get some more on Apple's new expansion in India and bring in Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. Mark, you reported a few weeks ago that even internally, Apple has been restructuring to better serve that market in India. What's the latest there? Yeah, India is all the hype uh, for Apple right now, really outside of these two retail stores, right? These retail stores, probably not going to move the needle uh, for Apple as a company revenue-wise, even uh, in India itself. Most Apple products in India and elsewhere, uh, of course, are going to be bought by consumers at third-party retail stores or online or carrier partners, right? But this shows Apple's dedication to the area. These stores are not small investments. You have to hire, you know, 100 people plus per store. Uh, you have to do inventory. They're setting up the Genius Bar and classes in India uh, for the first time. And internally this year, they're restructuring their sales organization. So the head of India sales, right, what's known as their managing director or country manager for India, is now going to report directly to Apple's head of sales globally, right? That's going to be a first. Previously, uh, you had a vice president in between who oversaw uh, India as well as other emerging markets like Eastern yes. Europe and Africa. So that layer uh, has been removed, sort of elevating the importance of India within the company's operations itself. There's a lot of data when it comes to Apple flying out of India right now. You know, the, the latest reporting from Bloomberg is from a sales perspective, $6 billion for the 12-month period through March. That's just one side of the story. The other is supply chain and manufacturing, right? And I think the latest reporting from Bloomberg is the dollar value of exports or iPhones constructed in that nation hit a new milestone as well. What is the strategy for Apple in, in having a supply chain base in that nation? 
Yeah, the strategy uh, for Apple to have a supply chain base in India is twofold. One, you really need to manufacture devices that you're selling in India, in India itself, uh, to save on some of those import taxes, right, which are incredibly high as they are in Brazil, uh, another place where Apple has set up shop to produce iPhone. So that's one part of it. The bigger component is diversification, right? Until now, Apple had mostly produced all of its devices in China. But over the last four to five years or so, you've seen issues related to tariffs. Uh, you've seen the potential trade war between the U.S. and China. You've seen these COVID zero policies in China. Uh, you've seen the impact of the virus in China and on Apple's production. So you've seen delay after delay to key products. Uh, the MacBook Air last year, the iPhone 14 Pro, this was just at the end of 2022, right? Two years plus into COVID. And you saw major shutdowns at Foxconn that prevented Apple from selling as yes. many iPhone 14 Pros as possible. So you really need to diversify to try to avoid problems like that. And that's what you're seeing Apple lay the groundwork for in India primarily, but also in places like Vietnam and Malaysia and Brazil as well, plus a little bit of Ireland. So, so that's the India story. Let's, let's go a bit more global. We asked our audience, if you're going to buy an Apple product, where do you do it? In store, in online, or is, as you were explaining, from a third party, right, other retailers, 55% of respondents online is where they're buying. What is store strategy broadly for Apple? What is the future of the Apple store with its shiny glass windows? You know, I think the poll is a little skewed, right? It was a Twitter poll, and perhaps our audience on Twitter, they're people who you know, want to go to an Apple store to buy an iPhone, or they live near Apple stores. Uh, but the actual truth is that the vast majority of iPhones, at least, they're actually purchased through third-party retailers and carriers, right? Whether that's your Verizon store in the U.S. or your O2 store uh, in the U.K. or in Best Buy or Target or elsewhere uh, in the U.S. or car phone warehouse in Europe, right? And so Apple really wants a lot more of those sales to flow uh, through its own retail stores, right? And we've seen a slowdown in expansion for retail stores over the last three to four years or so, primarily due to COVID. Another reason is they have so many at this point. But what you're seeing is they're pushing more stores now in that Asia area, right? You have India. They've opened yes. uh, more stores in Korea recently. And then they have stores coming in Malaysia as well. Uh, so clearly yes. their expansion is, is Asia related at this point. Mark, the other big story of the week is Apple, in partnership with Goldman Sachs, offering a savings account with a 4.15% yield. Why is Apple doing that? Yeah, so this was actually introduced several months ago, uh, right? It was a little bit delayed. It's now rolling out in the wallet app if you have an Apple card. And, you know, some people think that Apple has big ambitions here, and that is absolutely true. Uh, but the reality is, is that this is still going to be U.S. only and still Apple card only. Uh, eventually, this is probably going to expand as the Apple Card expands, hopefully. I know a lot of people in Europe and Canada want to get their hands on that. 4.15% is a pretty good rate. Uh, that's actually a quarter percent higher than the rate that Goldman offers if you were to create a savings account through the Goldman website uh, versus through the Apple Card. And this is Apple wanting to give more people reasons to hold on to their iPhone, right? right. If you have your savings account in your phone, it's going to make it all but impossible every time they add a new layer, a new feature to switch away to Android or to another product. All right, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman with all the latest on Apple. Thank you. Now, coming up, revenue from fixed income, one of the main highlights as big banks like Goldman Sachs, but also Bank of America report quarterly results. We'll get more on how those lenders performed coming up. But let's take a look at some of the stocks, how we're moving, how we're reacting. Some interesting numbers, but you look at the equity markets in in the banking space, Goldman down one and a half percent, Bank of America off by eight tenths of a percent. Why? We'll ask that question next with Bloomberg Shanali Basak. This is Bloomberg. Quarterly results from Bank of America and Goldman Sachs show different approaches to fixed income trading, with Bank of America topping estimates as fixed income trading drives profits. Meanwhile, Goldman Sachs failed to capitalize on the trend. Who else is here but Bloomberg News, Wall Street reporter Shanali Bassett. Give me the banking scorecard this Tuesday morning. 
Yeah, it's hard not to pay attention to those trading numbers because they posted, Goldman Sachs had posted a drop relative to the others that was worth noticing because you saw Beats, a JP Morgan Citigroup, and a Bank of America. However, I would still say that these are broader market moves as well because you have the commodities business not as strong as it was a year ago when you had massive volatility in the industry and same with currencies. I do want to point to some other things in the businesses here too because remember Goldman Sachs had cut some headcount here while Bank of America became the third big bank to show increasing headcount. That is a fascinating story at a time where we've seen a lot of pressure on jobs across the entire market. I want to take a little bit of a technology angle here as well because as we know Goldman as people look to how they are reshaping the firm uh, the consumer business, the business tied to markets is of high attention and you have David Solomon, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, saying that they're uh, exploring a sale of Green Sky. This is the right. installment lending platform they had bought just a couple of years ago. So that is still something as Goldman transforms is weighing on its results in the near term. But again, we're looking over to the other side. Bank of America, by the way, pulling in lots of deposits here uh, and lots of new clients rather as deposits are under pressure as we watch to see how this kind of banking Trump tumble really starts to play out. So real quick, there's also tension here for Goldman, right? Questions about, hold on, you have Marcus, but you also have now Apple savings at 4.15% mm -hmm. yield. Don't they do the same thing? I'm really glad you asked that because the answer is no. Uh, on one hand, you do have a consumer business here. They folded into platform solutions by working with Apple at 4.15%. Uh, this really intense yield you're getting from that Apple savings product with Goldman Sachs. It's pulling deposits, lowering the cost of funding for Goldman right. Sachs, whereas they're selling loans associated with that Marcus portfolio. And as you know, lending to high net worth individuals and private wealth instead. All right, Bloomberg Shinali, Basak on the Wall Street beat. Thank you. Now, coming up, we're going to take a look at the state of data security with Rubrik CEO, Bipal Senior. A lot of questions around the right way of protecting data. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Let's get a little check on the markets here. We kind of turned a corner in the last few minutes. NASDAQ 100 modestly higher, just a tenth of 1%, basically flat, without performance in the chip sector. Comments from St. Louis Fed President James Bullard basically saying more hikes still on the table. Um, and the market digesting that. Look at the short end of the curve, the two-year up by three basis points, 4.22%. Bitcoin, as Katie Greifel was telling us earlier in the program, holding above 30,000 US dollars per token. So continue to track that in the, in the risk asset space. There's one mover that we're keeping an eye on, which is Southwest Airlines, a technology issue temporarily grounded a number of flights that the Southwest team had to, to coordinate with the FAA over. We're off session lows, but still lower, 1.2%. Let's stick with that story and get the latest details with Catherine Larkin, who's the global business editor at Bloomberg News. Uh, simply put, Kathy, what happened? Oh, thanks for having me, Ed. So yet again, we're seeing Southwest with a big operations problem today. They had a 16-minute ground halt that uh, delayed over 1,000 planes this morning. They said it had to do with a, um, a vendor-supplied firewall. It, prevent pla it prevented planes from taking off um, or leaving the gate. And this is just, you know, while a short-term problem, was, you know, 16 minutes, it really caused a big mess for this morning's air traffic. So, as I said, the stock down 1.2%. We have been markedly lower. Um, it was 16 minutes of chaos, basically. How, how impactful was it for flights around the country? Yeah, so the problems actually seem to emerge even before that ground halt was put in place. So, like I said, over a thousand flights, you know, were delayed. We wouldn't be surprised to see um, several of these flights be canceled by the end of the day. This is really a ongoing problem for Southwest. You remember in December, they stranded tens of thousands of passengers right around the holidays. They uh, are just seeing, you know, repeat problems with their, their operations and their scheduling. And even here, if it's a vendor issue, that, that still ultimately comes down to management to be accountable. It's interesting because I remember last month uh, there was a partnership announced between Southwest and AWS on the cloud side uh, to try and rectify some of the sort of long-standing systemic technological issues. Begs the question of kind of what happens next for Southwest, Kathy. 
No, uh, they are going to have to answer questions. I mean, this is something, like you said, they've been talking about for the last several months. They say that they're putting new systems in place to prevent future issues, and yet here we go again today with a major issue, you know, a, a, a big ground halt, not something we see every day. Uh, they're going to have their earnings in just, um, you know, uh, another like couple of weeks, April 27th, and management's going to be asked to, to answer for this. This is, this is really unacceptable, and I think flyers are going to start to think twice whether they want to book with Southwest. All right, Bloomberg's global business editor, Catherine Larkin, thank you very much. All right, let's move from transport to cyber. And in cyber news, the European Union just proposed several new cybersecurity efforts basically aimed at bolstering the bloc's response to online threats. The new plan, which still needs to be approved, as is often the case in Europe, would link national and cross-border operation centres across the EU to detect and act on threats, among other measures. And what about the USA? How are organisations grappling with data security? And what more can be done? Let's ask people, Senior CEO of Rubrik, who joins me here in San Francisco. You have just put out a pretty wide-ranging report, survey-based. Uh, companies all across the country globally keep telling us we're investing in cybersecurity, data protection. What did your report find? Thank you so much for the opportunity. They are still not secure. What we found was every organization has already been infiltrated. 99% of the IT and security leader that we surveyed reported uh, cyber incidents in their organization, and 52 times last year. So almost one cyber attack per week, which essentially means that all the prevention tools and technology that they have purchased over the years, while needed, is not sufficient. It's not working. A, a part of your, your findings, your survey, was actually in many cases, companies across all sectors do have a backup plan. It's just the backup plan doesn't work. Well, is that a lack of investment, a lack of care? a lack of strategy, what, are the, what is at the core of that vulnerability? So legacy backup was built for human error recovery or natural disaster recovery. It was not built for cyber. As a result, it is vulnerable. In our finding, what, what we found that the nine out of the 10 organizations actually saw an attempt to manipulate their backup. And what was interesting was that three out of the four attempts were successful. So folks, fundamentally, the bad guys know that it is a vulnerability for most of the organizations, and they are going after it. The, the behavior of attackers and the industry response really interesting, ransomware being a great example. There are lots of incidences of late where, in a ransomware attack, the hackers leak the information they obtained, the data they obtained, in order to, to kind of induce a payup. How do you protect against that? Ransomware is particularly nasty problem. What we found was that over 72% of the organizations we surveyed paid ransom. That was an incredible stats. And what is interesting is that only 16% of these organizations, after paying ransom, could recover their data using the decrypted tool from the threat actors. So essentially, businesses are at their wit's end to really take care of the ransom, ransomware problem, not only in terms of the locking of their data, but as you said, in terms of like exposure of their business critical data, whether it's customer data or their own internal data. Rubric, let's talk about the company. I think you've been quite open about a cybersecurity incident where hackers leak some data linked to you. Did you pay a ransom in that case? What was the scenario that played out? I mean, uh, a threat actor got hold of one of our test bed system in the IT department, and we actually laid it out what happened. Uh, as a case study. As a case study, as, as how they entered and what did they do as part of our blog post. And then the threat actor put our name in their name and shame website. People who don't pay ransom, they get their name so and shame. So you didn't pay the ransom. And, uh, and uh, I mean, it is very clear what we did. We did not. And, uh, and then... Um, and then what we did was we used Rubrik's own technology to, to restore our services. And this is our core message that attacks are inevitable and businesses need to have resilience strategy as opposed to just prevention. I know there's a lot of interest in Rubrik from investors globally. Um, cybersecurity space seems to have some momentum behind it, some dollars behind it. So do you take the opportunity in that and go public? Have you thought about a timeline to, to an IPO? 
we want to be a public company. We want to build a long-term company, and pub we're going public is is the is the route. We are uh, doing work on our end to prepare ourselves. We are also looking at the at the markets and trying to understand how where the market is. We'll want to be public when the market is ready, and we are ready. Paipal Sinha, CEO of Rubik, thank you for joining me here in San Francisco. Now, as we ramp up to Earth Day this Saturday, we continue to take a look at new technologies in the fight against climate change, like air travel. Bloomberg's Steve Rappaport has more. The race to reduce carbon emissions from air travel has seen multiple milestones this year, with two companies having completed successful test flights of hydrogen-powered aircrafts. UK startup Zero Avia said it successfully conducted a test flight of a hydrogen-powered 19-seater plane in January, and in March, a universal hydrogen plane equipped with the largest hydrogen fuel cell ever to power an aircraft had a successful 15-minute flight of a modified Dash 8 aircraft in Washington State. It is the beginning of a flight test campaign that will ultimate, ultimately culminate in a 2025 entry into passenger service of 50 to 60 seat um, uh, regional airplanes, uh, uh, starting with the ATR-72. The Paris Agreement has a goal of net zero emission air travel by 2050, and hydrogen powered planes present one of the most promising options. So aviation is one of the few sectors that's actually forecasted to grow in emissions on the time horizon of the Paris Agreement by, by, by 2050. Um, and so, uh, so hydrogen probably represents uh, the best and only hope the sector really has to make a, a meaningful dent, right, enough to offset continuing traffic growth. The only alternative we as an industry have is curtailing, is curtailing traffic volumes in order to, uh, to reduce emissions. Connect Airlines, which operates regional flights between Toronto and Chicago and Philadelphia, has already placed an order to convert 75 planes to hydrogen power through universal hydrogen. And Air New Zealand is working with a series of partners as it looks to make its aircraft fleet zero emission. However, several hurdles remain, including how best to transport the hydrogen and space limitations of the hydrogen modules aboard the aircrafts. But these test flights present a promising step in the right direction as airlines work towards reduced emissions. Steve Rappaport, Bloomberg News. Let's stick with the hydrogen story. Nikola shares jumping as much as 12% on Monday, now up around 9%, coming off an all-time low last Friday. What's astonishing with this stock? Up for a second consecutive day. Biggest two-day gain going back to October. This is one of those companies that went public via SPAC 2020. But the long-term story is around not just building fuel cell trucks but also the hydrogen infrastructure to power them but again very volatile you know really really heading towards penny stock territory interesting now coming up we're going to take a pulse of the vc landscape and what generative ai has to offer to venture capitalists with race capital general partner alfred chuang that's next this is bloomberg Time now for the VC Roundup. Let's start with Devon, the pioneer of the shale revolution that reignited U.S. oil and natural gas production. It's now getting into geothermal renewable energy, a $10 million investment into geothermal startup Fervo Energy. And over in Europe, venture capital firms are on pace for their lowest year of funding since 2015 as the weaker stock market, rising interest rates, is causing larger institutional investors, LPs, like pension funds, to pull back in the VC space. Let's bring in Race Capital General Partner Alfred Chuang for his read on the VC landscape here in the US, in Europe, and globally. You issued this like rallying cry in the pandemic era. You wanted your founders and CEOs to be more active, do more. You wanted your industry peers to do more. And then the world sort of fell apart, higher rates, the war in Ukraine. Where does your rallying cry sit now? Uh, Ed, good morning, and very good to see you. Thank you for having me back. Um, most definitely, I think this is uh, an economic environment that uh, clearly is for investing is not for the faint-hearted at all. I think we have seen um, 
VC funding for startups dropped over 50% down to $76 billion in the first quarter. That was globally, that That's figure. Globally, yeah. yes. And then we saw all the spec deal, the whole frenzy went away. Uh, we also saw uh, the IPO market is an all-time low. We also had uh, Silicon Valley Bank went under after four decades of service specific, specifically for our industry. So these are huge monumental impact that we've seen in the industry itself. So uh, it's a tough time, yeah. I'm really interested on the relationship between the public and private markets, but also how you follow the same data sets that a public market investor would be. So today, one of the stories is Fed speak. Right. James Bullard of the St. Louis Fed saying actually more hikes. So if you think about an inflation regime, a hike regime being there for longer, how does that impact the mindset of a venture capitalist? So obviously it has an impact. A, clearly it will have an impact on evaluation. So if you look at like very late stage deal, uh, like Stripe is now down 30% during this time. So we have to expect late stage deals when its prices goes down, it will trickle down all the way to the earlier stage deal. The impact to the deals that my team and I at Race Capital are involved in are very early stage, seed and pre-seed. In those um, particular kind of investments, the impact has been a lot less because people, people are still very hopeful to look out a much longer period of time horizon for technological innovation. So we, we've discussed that contrast on the program. Pretty dour, broad outlook from VCs. A lot of excitement about the, the seed and pre-seed stage. Is it just simply because it's, it's easier to write a smaller check and, and not lose as much sleep over it? And actually, I don't think that's the case. I think actually it has a lot more to do with the thesis itself. If you look at what we do, because we're so early, we have to look out for the kind of company and technological innovation. What will happen to them? What impact will they have 10 years down the road, or sometimes even longer? So for that, downturn has always been proven. I mean, I myself have gone through, ran large companies, tech, public company, during up and downturns. There's no better time to invest in early stage things for new invention, for the outlook of how our world's going to be evolving to 10 years down the road. Artificial intelligence. How many times a day do you say the words artificial and intelligence at the moment? <laughs> Our offices in Palo Alto, not enough. Every street corner, every conversation at Starbucks, every conversation in an office, every everything is about generating. You're AI. investing in the area. Of course we are, yeah. And, and how do you invest in the yeah. area? So we have specifically focused on the impact of this level of generative AI for automation in the enterprise. So we think the biggest opportunity and the safest place to deploy these type of technology is inside the enterprise itself. Large banks, large telcos, pharmaceuticals, governments, those are great places that you can wall in the learning itself and then be able to control and pace and govern how AI will be used. You, you kind of have this race between Alphabet, the parent company of Google, Google and Microsoft and, and a, a person who you may have called, uh, heard of called Elon Musk weighed into the middle of that. Yeah. What do you make of Elon Musk saying, you know what, I'm, I'm going to enter the AI race? Yeah. Um, I think this will be something very difficult to end. You, you just think about this, right? Put it in context. We have not seen a disruptive technology like this since the late 90s, how the internet has done to companies. Remember what had happened to Microsoft? They were behind in the browser war. So this is even bigger. We saw Microsoft gone out to do a deal that's $10 billion plus with OpenAI, yeah. a company nobody heard of until last year, right? So November. Of November, course. okay. So, so think of this context. And now they're using this to disrupt Google, which has a franchise that's been going on forever on search, worth $1.3 trillion. This is the only time we've seen little company now have a chance to impact and make huge impact in the innovation we, of large companies. We've been talking so much about AI that we haven't talked as much about crypto, and that was an area where you made some pretty fast and in some cases not as good bets. Uh, what is your reaction to, to that statement, I suppose? But also, do you, you know, would you change how you do your due diligence now, how you look at that space? Yeah, so without a doubt, um, crypto was um, you know, the last excitement that we saw in 2020 and 2021. Uh, we made some very, very, some very extremely good bets, you know, uh, contrary to the belief itself. So obviously we... And some bad bets. Oh, and some bad bets. I mean, we learned a lot in this process, but we didn't make huge bad bets, you know, so I think that was um, 
um, what we are um, designed to do as an early stage venture firm. You look at what had happened, crypto is addressing a much smaller addressable market. So it's TEM is far smaller than comparing to let's say Gen AI. So the magic right. of I would say race capital as a fund is we always said we are all of our infrastructure, whether yep. it is Web two, Web three, we do them more. So we have were able to hatch those kind of bets. All right, race capitals, Alfred Chuang, thank you so much. Now coming up Athleisure brand Lululemon may be looking to sell Mirror, one of its most recent acquisitions. More on why it's exploring now and what it could be worth next. Take a look at the shares as we head to break. This is Bloomberg. Lululemon is exploring the sale of Mirror only three years after buying the fitness equipment maker, this according to sources. This comes as fitness-focused hardware companies have struggled, basically, post-pandemic as consumers head back to gyms for in-person workouts. Liana, Deal, uh, Liana Baker, who leads our deals coverage, is here with more. It, it does feel like just yesterday that we were talking about this deal going ahead in the first place. As a longtime deals reporter, we tend to see this. Companies will get in a mode where they're buying assets, and then just a few years later, they'll sell assets. Bankers, luckily, get to work on both sides of these deals each time, so everyone's happy in terms of getting paid. But uh, Lululemon definitely here is looking to recoup some of that $500 million that they invested in this. Well, that raises the question of valuation. Are they going to sell it for more than they bought? At this point, we don't know what exactly this deal will fetch, but it does seem pretty clear that they won't get the $500 million. I think they're just trying to recoup some of the investment. But from what I've seen, this hasn't performed that well for Lululemon. It's unclear if it makes money. The company took a charge of $443 million, an impairment charge, uh, earlier this year. So clearly, it's not a huge moneymaker, and that could weigh on the valuation. It takes two to tango, sometimes more, actually, in a, in a complicated piece of M&A. But who could buy Mirror? It's a great question. You mentioned before the changing habits uh, for remote fitness and working out at home. And a lot of the companies in the space are challenged right now. So Peloton, let's say, could make sense as a buyer, but they don't have the money, given all the challenges that are going on there. Tonal, another company in the space, they just switched out their CEO. They cut their valuation. So it is kind of unclear if there's a strategic competitor out there that could buy this. Uh, potentially private equity. They love to look at unloved assets to see if they could do a turnaround. So I would imagine that the investment bankers that are working with Lululemon are casting a wide net to find a potential buyer. Very, very quickly, Anna, do we have a timeline on this? Where is this deal stage at? At this point, it's pretty early. We do know there's a bank engaged on this. So uh, I would say probably, you know, a few months from now. But it, it's hard to say with deals. Uh, and Lululemon, of course, could always hold on to the asset. If they don't get bids that they like, they might say, OK, let's just shut it down or do something else it. with it. We'll keep you posted. All right. Bloomberg's Liana Baker on the deals beat. Thank you very much. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Stay with Bloomberg in the next hour. Ryan Reynolds joins us, well-known technology investor and football club owner. Don't forget, recap the show, check out the podcast wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and all of the Bloomberg platforms. From San Francisco, this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.